When I tell somebody about an upcoming or recent backcountry adventure, it often sparks memories of their own wilderness experience. They might recall backpacking in the mountains, a rugged bikepacking route, or a thrilling rafting trip. But the most common story I hear is about a canoeing trip in the Boundary Waters. This iconic region straddling the Canada-US border is one of the most celebrated in North America. In fact, it's the most visited wilderness area in the Americas, which might explain why so many people reminisce about it. It's also one of the reasons I've never ventured there before. After thoroughly enjoying a canoe trip in Woodland Caribou Park last year, we decided it was time to see what all the fuss was about. We chose to explore the northern part of the Boundary Waters from west to east. To help counter my demerit idiosyncrasy of avoiding people and the traces they leave in the backcountry, we're going late in the season and sticking to the Canadian side, where there are typically fewer visitors. It seemed like our best chance for solitude. Follow along if you're interested in seeing what this trip had in store. We started this trip from Beaver House Lake and paddled approximately 50 miles over six days across the park to French Lake. I chose this route to give us a good sample of Quetico, taking us past some pictographs, through excellent lake trout waters, and with relatively little portaging for a route of this length. Logistically, our outfitter Linda with Quetico North Outfitters picked us up at French Lake where we left our vehicle and shuttled us around to Beaver House Lake. Our goal for the first day was to paddle south on Beaver House, portage into Quetico Lake, and camp on an island in the northwest part of this large lake. The portage trail to Beaver House Lake was mostly flat, dry, well-worn, and wide open. We set out on this trip as a party of three, plus two dogs. First up, we have Dylan, a professional hydrologist who's intimately familiar with water and the great outdoors, but on his first paddling trip. He knows maps and how to have a good time. Then there's Mason, likes to go fast, does electrical wiring on space shuttles, houses, or something like that, a repeat average Joe's offender, but also on his first canoeing trip. And myself, along with Amanda and our two border collies. We faced a light headwind as we paddled towards the south end of Beaver House Lake, but we were happy it wasn't strong enough to hold us back, as we've heard Beaver House is infamous for challenging south winds. As a bonus, we went late enough in the year to self-register, so we didn't need to paddle all the way to the ranger station on the south end to acquire our permit. The portage between Beaver House and Quetico Lakes is short and easy. Both ends of the portage and along the trail are full of signs of the area's logging history. We stopped to check out the old Model A car, as well as other relics, ax heads, saws, chains, logging spikes, old barrels, and other metal pieces, some so old they used flathead screws, and submerged logs in the shallows. With the well-worn portages, plentiful trash, motor boats for the rangers, and already seeing more people in the first 15 minutes than we did over nine days last year in Woodland Caribou Park, I was getting a little nervous about finding solitude. Once we got back on the open water, we turned to enjoy the tailwind we'd earned on Beaver House. We rode the waves and trolled to the north side of Quetico Lake, reaching a nice island campsite. It was a fairly easy first day, and we made camp early enough to take our time setting up and enjoy a relaxing evening. Day two started out dead calm and beautiful. 
Our goal was to paddle along the northern end of Quetico Lake, searching for pictographs. Before portaging into a lake, I've proven to be incapable of correctly pronouncing. Casacolquag Lake. We paddled, trolled, and fished our way across Quetico Lake. The smallmouth bass fishing was fantastic, and we even caught a few walleye and northern pike. But our main focus was spotting the many pictographs along the North Shore. While we're sure we didn't see them all, we did manage to find quite a few. These ancient artworks are typically found on steep, light-colored granitic rock faces that overhang the water, accessible only by canoe. Often, they're in locations protected from above. The pictographs are red, created from red ochre paint. This paint was made by heating microbial biogenic iron oxide, an orange-brown sediment, to between 1400 and 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, producing the vivid red we see today. Mixed with natural oils and fats, the paste was used to paint in places of deep spiritual significance. I find it incredible how well the paint has endured the elements over time. Quetico Lake is vast, with endless fingers and coves to explore. I think we could have easily spent all six days here and never gotten bored. But we had places to go and people not to see. Even though we spent half the day paddling, we only scratched the surface of what the lake has to offer. We exited Quetico Lake via the stream on the northeast side, expecting to paddle up to a 460 meter portage. The stream was navigable only for a short distance before we found ourselves dragging and pushing the canoes through the shallows, with a thunderstorm creeping up behind us. In some spots, the bottom was mucky, but for the most part, we avoided any waist deep surprises by finding the sandy areas. Eventually, the stream became too shallow to continue dragging the canoes, so we portaged alongside it to the start of the maintained trail. Halfway through the portage, the rain cut loose. It had been 80 degrees, and the effort of the portage had us soaked in sweat, so we skipped putting on rain gear. Of course, the cold rain came with plenty of wind to rapidly chill us down. There are a few things I enjoy more than introducing my friends to Type 2 Fun, so it was my distinct pleasure to initiate Dylan. Type 2 Fun, you know, the kind that builds character, improves self-esteem, and makes for better memories. I'm pretty sure he's hooked now and fiending for more. Once the lightning moved off and the wind died down just enough for me to solo paddle into the headwind, we headed off into Casacolquag Lake. We had the lake all to ourselves and found a campsite at the first island we came to. After we set up, the sun peaked out and we managed to dry off and warm up. We received more rain overnight, so we didn't rush to pack up our tents on day three. Our goal for the day was to make it across Casacolquag Lake and partway through McAlpine Lake. Our map showed two portages between the lakes, but after dragging through the stream the day before and hearing that there had been low water levels in years past, we made sure to leave ourselves plenty of time for this one as well. We spent most of the morning fishing as we casually paddled across Casacolquag Lake. The smallmouth bass were biting, and we even caught a pike or two, but no lake trout, the real reason I was excited to fish this lake. While we didn't see any people on this lake, we did have a spectator, a bald eagle that followed Dylan and Mason along the shoreline. Whether it was hoping they'd share their catch or just enjoying their colorful conversations and their tall tales, we couldn't say. We observed lots of bird life on this trip. Some standouts for me were the black-backed woodpeckers, a small group of ruffed grouse that wandered through our camp, completely unbothered. I'm guessing they must have felt safe, isolated on the island with few predators. And then, of course, there were loons, common as their name suggests, but their calls never get old. I love how they just pop up beside you in the middle of a lake, always a pleasant surprise. At the end of Casacolquag, we entered McAlpine Creek. 
We expected shallow waters that would force us to drag our canoes like the day before, but aside from a sizable beaver dam, it was smooth sailing. Perhaps the beavers were doing us a favor, keeping the stream navigable. We paddled right on past the first portage on our map and only needed to take the second smaller one at the end. Once we entered McAlpine, we noticed more signs of beaver activity as we paddled towards the center of the lake. By mid-afternoon, we found a great campsite on the north side and with a bit of a headwind, we decided to call it a day. The site had plenty of room for our tents, a nice landing, and a fantastic view from the fire ring. That evening, we relaxed, watching ominous clouds drift by. There was rain in the forecast, and it looked like it might do just that several times, but luckily, we stayed dry all night. The morning of the fourth day marked the first day of fall. The setting moon was just as incredible as the sunrise, both happening at nearly the same time. This rare phenomenon occurs only when there's a full moon near the spring or autumn equinox. It was cool to witness it in such an awesome location with a camp that allowed us to watch both to the east and to the west. We were up at sunrise every morning and usually we took our time with breakfast, coffee, and enjoying camp. But this morning, we packed up early to hit the water, knowing we had several portages and many miles ahead. Our goal was to make it through three portages into Batchewan Lake, and then our map showed one final portage into Pickerel Lake, where we planned to snake our way through some of the west end before finding a spot to camp. The first portage was over 500 meters long, gaining a noticeable amount of elevation heading east. Aside from one fallen tree and a small stream, the trail was wide open and easy. The next two lakes and portages were progressively smaller and simpler. It's hard to believe this day had the most portages of our trip. We finished them all before noon, and I'm not sure we even had to break a sweat. Our map showed a short portage to enter Pickerel. I'm not sure if this is for when the water is low or maybe it gets rough when the difference in stage between the two lakes is greater, but we were pleased to find out it was navigable when we went through. I was on a mission this trip to get a picture of a lake trout for my poster. I failed this mission last year, and with this trip over half over, and not catching anything, and hearing from other fishermen we encountered that it was slow, I was getting nervous. I was trolling whenever possible, and followed some advice I got to bring a depth finder along so I could target some of the depths and structures they're known to prefer. On the fourth day, I finally hooked into my first lake trout. Initially, I wasn't very excited as I thought it felt like a pipe. But as I got it up to the boat, I could see the fork tail I'd been looking for for so long now, and my excitement level escalated quickly. I was able to net the trout and get it into my boat before it shook the barbless hooks necessary in the park. Mason and Dylan were nearby and able to take a quick picture so I can officially mark the mighty Mackinac off my list before I released it back down to continue patrolling the deep, dark depths. We found a nice, but very heavily used campsite for our first night on Pickerel Lake. Though we were happy to call it home for the night as the tank was starting to run low and we were ready to relax. Maybe I'll get a little bit more, that's exciting. A little bit more. Our goal for day five was to enjoy some fishing while covering a good portion of the massive Pickerel Lake. With its tremendous size, countless islands, narrow passages, and excellent fishing, all accessible without any portages from French Lake, it's easy to see why Pickerel is such a popular spot. While we didn't encounter many people while we were there, the signs of heavy use were abundant. Many of the decent campsites we stopped to check out were completely trampled, making them easy to spot from the shore with deadfall and vegetation wiped out. I imagine during peak season there are far more visitors than the half dozen we saw. 
After breaking camp, we slowly paddled along, stopping to fish here and there. We dealt with a quartering headwind most of the day, so we tried to stick close to the south shoreline whenever possible. While the breeze was modest, it made paddling tough in more exposed areas, especially for a one-by paddler, and the water got a bit choppy. With no portages and a relatively short distance to cover, we had plenty of time to stop for lunch. We kept a lake trout and found a calm spot out of the wind to fry it up and enjoy the fresh cooked meal and surroundings. One thing I really appreciated about Quetico was the diversity in plant life. There were so many varieties of mosses, shrubs, aquatic plants, and more. The biggest thing I noticed compared to woodland caribou, other than not being mostly burned, was the seemingly increased diversity in trees. My favorite were the white pines, which were abundant along our route in Quetico. After lunch, we continued along Pickerel's South Shore, eventually cutting over to one of the eastern islands. As we left the protection of the shoreline, the waves picked up, reminding us how glad we were we didn't have to go too far. We chose one of the many well-worn campsites on this large island for our final night. Thunderstorms and showers lingered nearby for most of the evening, but we only experienced a few sprinkles at camp as the weather stayed to the north and the west. The last day of the trip is always the hardest for me. I can't help but wonder where all the time went, wishing I had just a few more days out here. I think Dylan and Mason, on the other hand, were ready for a vacation from their vacation, as they eagerly set off for the final stretch. All that remained was paddling across the rest of Pickerel Lake, down the stream into French Lake, and over to the landing where our vehicle was parked. We were lucky enough to have one of the infamous West Pickerel tailwinds, which quickly pushed us across the lake. The sheer size of Pickerel's east-west fetch meant that even a modest breeze stirred up sizable waves, but we made great time. Once we entered the stream, though, the waves disappeared and everything felt calm. We paddled slowly and quietly through this sheltered marshy stretch, hoping to catch a glimpse of some larger wildlife, as we'd seen none so far on this trip. Despite our hopes, the only creatures we spotted were turtles perched on fallen trees along the waterway. As we paddled through this area, it made me think of a Kevin Callan quote I'd heard. I don't recall if it was one of his books or a video, but I remember him saying something along the lines of, it's not a postcard, it's an experience. I think that perfectly sums up our trip. While we didn't witness any dramatic, breathtaking views most deem postcard worthy, like we're used to seeing in the western backcountry, this trip was defined by the experience itself. The collective sights, sounds, challenges, and the sheer immersion in a landscape that can only be explored this way by canoe. Even the solitude we found, as we had a 48-hour stretch all to ourselves. It's something that can't be captured in a single photo, and yet, if I had to sum it up in a five-second montage, I think it'd be this, Dylan perfectly summarizing it with just his own two thumbs. If I can elaborate on Dylan's perfect explanation, I would say I hope to return to Quetico one day to explore and enjoy more of what it has to offer. But I also think it's a far cry from untouched wilderness. Its easy access means well-worn portages, trampled campsites, and contains many signs of human history with old trash and scars left behind by loggers, prospectors, and trappers. But in the end, it just depends on what you're looking for in a canoe trip. For some, ease of access, clearly marked trails, and remnants of the past may all be bonuses. As they say, different strokes for different folks, right? Hell, I've even seen two people stroke the same side of a canoe. Whatever it is that floats your boat, I hope you find time to get out there and enjoy it yourself. Paddle on, friends.